Hey everyone, welcome to AshDev. Today, I will share with you 10 Unity tips. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, these insights will streamline your workflow and unlock new possibilities. So, let's jump right in and level up your game development skills. Tip number one. Let's say you wrote a code to find spawn point in each scene. But what if there's no spawn point in some scenes, like in your main menu or a non-gameplay scene like the store? You'll face an error message in console. To avoid this, I use try-catch statements. Let's say you're trying to add force to a rigid body component of a game object. In the try block, you attempt to apply this force. But if the game object doesn't have a rigid body attached, the catch block runs and attaches a rigid body to the object first, and then applies the force to it. By doing this, you can keep multiple cases in mind and then act upon them accordingly. Next, we have the try get component for tip number two, which is similar to try and catch statement. You can use this for getting any component, and if the component is there, then it will return true, otherwise false. So usually we use game object dot get component to get a reference of the game object. For example, get component rigid body, and then if rigid body is not equals to null, then perform some action which makes the code longer. Instead, we can use try get component. Now it tries to get component, and if the game object has the component, then perform the action. Otherwise, you can attach the component first and then perform the action. And there's another way of using this. Suppose you have a trigger, which is checking if the colliding object is player or not. You might usually use game object dot compare tag, or you use the game object dot name to get the reference of player, which can get a bit messy. Instead, try get component can streamline this. If the colliding object has a player controller component attached, then you immediately know it's the player and can act accordingly. This not only cleans up your code, but also makes it more efficient. Tip number three is about find objects by type. If you want to get all the instances of some class present in a scene, then there are two methods you might be familiar with. Find objects of type and find objects by type. Both return an array of objects, but there's a catch in terms of performance you should know about. Find objects of type tends to be more performance heavy because it always returns a sorted array based on the instance ID. So it is recommended to use find objects by type as it allows you to specify whether to sort the resulting array or not. This flexibility can save you a lot in terms of performance. So next time, make sure to opt for find objects by type instead of find object of type. For tip number four, I want to share some short C hash methods that help save time while coding. First, we have null conditional operator. Instead of checking whether an object is null before accessing its properties, you can simply write this one line code, which also means if person and name both are not null, then get the length of the name. Next, the ternary operator. Instead of writing a full-blown if-else block, you can use this. Here, if this condition is true, then this value is returned, else the other one is returned. Next, the null coalescing operator is perfect for assigning default values. Replace traditional if-else with this. It returns the value of its left-hand operand if it isn't null. Otherwise, it evaluates the right-hand operand and returns its result. Finally, the index from end operator. It allows for easy access to the last item of an array. By adding this operator before your array index value, C# -sharp will start at the end of the array and count backward to locate an element. Tip number five emphasizes the ability to load multiple scenes. This tip is really helpful for those working on multi-level games. Imagine you have different levels in your game, each composed of smaller sections that are reused across levels. Instead of the tedious process of copy-pasting these sections, you can turn each section into its own scene. Then, you can seamlessly integrate these scenes to construct your levels. This feature not only offers convenience, it can significantly boost your game's performance. There are sections in game that the player can see and sections they can't. Using scripts, you can load the scene section where the player is headed based on triggers and simultaneously unload the scenes not currently visible to the player. By setting the loading mode to additive, Unity loads the new scene while keeping the previous one intact, allowing for smooth transitions between scene sections. Another useful way to use this feature is, 
Say you're working on a new level and need elements from a previous level. Simply open the previous level alongside your current scene. Drag and drop what you need. Then close the previous scene without saving. This way, you can borrow elements without altering the original scene. Tip number six highlights the debug mode in Unity's inspector panel. Typically, in the inspector, you only see public or serialized variables. Debug mode changes this. It reveals all types of variables, including private and non-serializable ones. This is great for inspecting your game's internal workings without altering your code structure. But two things to keep in mind. Debug mode shows non-serialized fields, but these aren't saved with your scene. And seeing private fields doesn't mean you can always edit them. This protects the integrity of your code's internal states. So use it wisely. For tip number seven, I will share some super useful Visual Studio shortcuts that can significantly speed up your coding workflow. Shift plus F12. This shortcut finds every reference to a selected symbol in your code. It's perfect for seeing the impact of changes or locating usages throughout your project. Control plus K plus C. This quickly comments out selected lines. It's a handy way to disable sections of code temporarily without deleting them. Control plus X and Control plus C. Control plus X cuts an entire line, and Control plus C duplicates the line you're on. These are great for quick edits and rearranging code efficiently. Control plus R. Use this to rename a variable and all its references in one go. It ensures consistency across your entire code base. Alt plus left click. By alt clicking on multiple lines, you can edit them all simultaneously. This is incredibly useful for making the same change on several lines at once. Control plus Shift plus F12. This jumps you to the next error or warning in your solution, making it much easier to navigate and fix problems in your code. Tip 8 introduces the generic singleton pattern. This pattern significantly enhances the modularity and maintainability of your code. The basic implementation involves a class like singleton for type T, where T represents a mono behavior. This class is responsible for typical singleton duties, binding or constructing an instance, ensuring only one exists, and destroying duplicates. Using this pattern, any class, such as Game Manager, can inherit from singleton, simplifying the entire process. There's no need to replicate singleton logic for each class. Tip number nine delves into destroyable singletons in Unity, a variation from the conventional singleton pattern. Unlike standard singletons that persist from the start to the end of an application's life cycle, destroyable singletons are specifically designed to be destroyed. This functionality is particularly valuable for managing objects that are relevant only in certain scenes or game states. It enables better resource management and contributes to a cleaner game architecture. Tip number 10 goes deeper into the concept of a dependency manager in Unity. Think of a dependency manager as a central system or object that manages and provides access to common references or components used in your game. It can be set up as a singleton, holding references to key objects or components like the player, enemies, or essential game systems. Unlike singletons, it will be destroyed each time on scene unload. Before the introduction of dependency managers, common practices included dragging and dropping variables directly in the inspector, which can be time-consuming and frustrating with a high number of references. Another approach involved frequently using methods like find and get component, leading to performance overhead from runtime searches and tightly coupled code. Alternatively, using multiple singletons could complicate your game, especially when these singletons are needed in subsequent scenes or vary between instances in each scene. As a better solution, a dependency manager holds all necessary references for a particular scene. However, there are important considerations. Avoid over-reliance on the dependency manager to prevent it from becoming a god object with too many responsibilities, which could lead to tightly coupled code and challenges in future modifications. That's it for today's Unity Tips. If you found this helpful, give a thumbs up and subscribe to AshDev. Don't forget to join our Discord community for more discussions. The link is given below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.